Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be watching us from. Welcome to the Gibbs CEO Flash Forum. Today, it gives me great pleasure to have the opportunity to profile and engage with the CEO of what I'd say one of the most successful and um, ambitious organizations that were born and bred in South Africa. Born in 1988, and today this organization employs over 132,000 employees, covering areas spanning consumer focus, pharmaceutical and industrial, freight services, financial services, office and print services, hard and soft services, I'm very curious to know more about that, travel services, and of course in 2020, the battered automotive retailing sector. Despite that, however, uh, this organization really lived the ethos from its chairman, uh, Mr. Bonang Mahale, who said, emerging stronger together. In fact, to be corrected, hashtag emerging stronger together. So allow me to introduce you to our CEO in the spotlight today. She is a young lady from Cebu King who went to a Catholic school and later to Mondio High. Of course, she then deviated and went to Wits University. I mentioned them because I suppose somebody has to mention them. And she attained first class degrees in economics, mathematics, and in finance, all from the University of the Witwatersrand. But of course, when you want to talk about leadership, we're very proud to call her one of our own. She's an alumnus of our executive, de uh, executive development program. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce you to Mpumi Madisa. Welcome, Mpumi. Thank you, Maris. Wonderful to be here. And welcome home. So Mpumi, as you know, when we discussed, I thought it would be useful for us to have, firstly, a strategy conversation. Sure. And then we can have a uh, a personal reflection conversation about 2020. Sure. Okay. So on, against that background, let's look at your latest announcement. And again, picking up on that theme coming from your chairman about hashtag emerging stronger together. We see that the group delivered strong recovery in cash flow and profits for the first half. In fact, I'm so excited to see what you're going to do in the second half, right? And this recovery comes driven by an amazing 37.9% growth rate in your services business, which is your largest part of your business. And of course, an increasingly important business, your manufacturing business, the commercial products business, which grew at also a spectacular 44.4% during lockdown. I just, I mentioned these numbers and I think to myself, am I making these things up? Mm -hmm. So to what extent do you, uh, do you, do, what extent are these um, performances sustainable? And especially in a context of a weak, albeit rebounding South African economy. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. We, we are proud, you know, of the results that we've been able to deliver. And I think Morris more so because we're delivering this set of results compared to a non-COVID 2019 comparative, um, whilst July to December 2020 was essentially still what we call COVID months. Um, so I think against that background, it's really, really a great performance from the team. Um, how do we get there? And then I'll touch on sustainability. I, you know, for me, there's two aspects of Bidvest that have really shone out in the first six months. The first is, is the power of our decentralized model. Um, decentralization, particularly in the last half year, has really given us tremendous power because we've enabled more than 200 businesses to simultaneously make quick decisions, restructure, right size, understand their changing operating environment, engage with their clients to understand what their client's evolution is and react quickly. So we, we haven't needed at group to kind of push all of that and drive it. It's happened in a decentralized model simultaneously. Um, and that's part of the results that you're seeing there. Uh, and then secondly, uh, the power in our diversification. 
you know, the diversity gave us a mix that at a consolidated level we could then deliver those kinds of results. So as parts of the economy were under strain, travel, aviation, um, hospitality, those sectors were really hard hit and lockdown lasted in those sectors far longer than the rest of the economy. So our businesses facing that part of the sector really felt the pressure. But then we had the upside, you know, in other parts of our businesses. And so once you put it all together, you then have a, a really combined result that, that is as you talk to it. Sustainability, we're very comfortable for second half of the year very comfortable that the underlying trading of our businesses will continue similarly in the first half. Uh, and secondly, that we'll get an uplift from the businesses that were hard hit, you know, so the ones that were really hard hit. I mean, for example, in our bank, uh, a big portion of our, of our income comes from Forex, um, and that right up to zero as people were not traveling globally. Yeah. Uh, that can only come back in the second half of the year. Even travel and hospitality is starting to pick up. So we're very comfortable that underlying trading should be very similar to the first half of the year. And then on top of that, we should have some rebounds. PHS obviously boosted our results nicely. Um, we acquired that hygiene business in May last year. Um, they're number one in washroom services in the UK, um, have about 30% market share. Um, right acquisition at the right time, at the right price. Um, and I suppose it was fortuitous that we've got a growth strategy that talks to expanding our hygiene footprint when what COVID has done is heightened the focus yep. on cleanliness, washing hands and hygiene. And so we're really in a sweet spot. Yeah. Um, and really it's a combination of all of that that's given us the edge. As a parent of teenagers, I, I can't tell you how hard it is to get the teenagers <laughs> to understand you need to wash your hands all the time and you need to be hygienic. And, and so certainly COVID has helped move us forward mm. as, a, as a humanity to become, uh, I suppose, more hygienic and organizations like yourself who are playing into that theme can only benefit. Allow me to reverse and focus on one of the comments that you've just made about the power of your decentralized model. Now, we, um, so my, my predecessor, Nicola Klein, uh, spoke in this, on this forum with the CEO of EOH, right, which also had mm. a very powerful decentralized model. Mm. And for the longest time, that model worked for EOH, mm. but until it stopped working, sure. <laughs> right? Sure. Um, and, and, and of course, uh, uh, Van Kola then comes in and cleans it up and he's improving it and we can see mm. with the amazing results that EOH experienced mm. last year also both operationally wise mm. as well as the market that he's really turned that corner around. What is the difference between let's say your mm. approach to, to decentralization that has worked for now 30 years plus, we're talking about 30 mm. odd, 32 years, 33 years this year plus, mm. all right, uh, compared to other organizations who might get their decentralization mm. model wrong. Sure, interesting question. So maybe before I talk about the decentralization, let me tell you what is centralized. And we've got very little in the yeah. group that is centralized. But one of the parts of our group that is centralized is governance, right? So, so governance is, is at the center. Uh, internal audit is controlled at the center. Uh, so the one lever that we have to look at governance system processes, protocols, we control, okay? And so the, that governance piece does sit at the center. Yes, we do have capability that goes into the divisions, but it, in a very strong way from a governance perspective, we have got governance oversight at a group level. Then, then going into decentralization, I suppose it depends what you mean by, by decentralization. You know, I mean, I've, I've got a very simplistic view around it because I come from one of the subsidiaries. So, I, uh, you know, I, I worked, I grew up in Prestige, which is our cleaning subsidiary. And, and essentially when I was in there, what we were taught was, one, run this business as if it is your own, okay? If, if you would never put your hand in the cookie jar in your own business, don't do that here. Okay, take personal accountability for this business, whether you're the CEO, whether you're exco, whether you're a GM, whether you're a client relations manager, it doesn't matter. So that's also part of the, the, around the decentralized culture. So it's just that personal accountability as if this business was your own. Um, secondly, um, the decentralization is so at a business at a business unit level, um, there's a peer now, but we decentralize that even further. And so for me, our decentralized model actually gives us transparency. 
So at group level, you get to see the performance of a division. You can also see one level down, the performance at a business unit level. So for a Steiner or a Matis or whichever business it is. But also even further than that, our regional offices run their own PNL. And so if you want to drill in further, you can say, so Prestige has got 60 branches. Which of the branches isn't working well? So it's divulged even further. So the branch manager in Kurumai is running a business with his own PLM, his own revenue, his own cost structure, and his own profitability and the other metrics that we measure. So if you wanted to actually peel back the onion, you can. Uh, you can peel it back by region. You can peel it back by division. You can peel it back by speciality. And then you can pull back up. And so we really decentralize right to the nth degree, which actually then gives you transparency, actually gives you greater transparency. Um, and everybody's got their own costs and their own accountability. Nothing um, subsidizes anything else. It's, it's all devolved into, into one PNL. Um, and, and then just really a culture of, of hard work, a culture of delivery. Uh, we've got a high performance culture. We compete, uh, which is healthy, which is great. Uh, compete not to the point that it's destructive. Um, and, and as you say, you know, success is something that we, we really live by. And yeah. so, I mean, those aspects for us are, are really um, part of the DNA within the group that really works. So I'm hearing some really powerful words to live by, uh, owner-manager culture, mm. um, informed by transparency, informed by deep sense of accountability, mm -hmm. and in a world of accountability, blame is actually absent because it's all there for everyone to see. And, and I'm hearing evidence-based, which means that uh, you actually follow the evidence and you can drive that. Now, I wonder when you are looking, because uh, um, when you're looking to buy organizations into a uh, bid vest, because that's part of your business mm. model, part of your success is sure. both a, an organic growth strategy, yes. which is what you've, we've been talking about, but also an acquisitive growth strategy. In fact, you're, you're smart in both acquisitions as well as disposal is part of the core mm. capability that has set Bidvest mm. apart. So against that background then, um, uh, how important is governance as a question that you seek to establish when you're looking for acquisitions? Sure, it's, it's exceptionally important. I mean, we do, we do an entire governance due diligence um, on its own uh, because once you've acquired a business, you acquire the good and the bad, right? Um, you acquire all the gremlins, so you have to be very clear about what gremlins potentially sit in there and, 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 and whether they talk to our culture and it's, it's what we want to have in our stable or not. Um, so, so that's very, very important. I mean, uh, one of the things as well that, that we DD quite thoroughly, and it's our first DD actually, is, is the people. We do a very deep people due diligence um, that talks to, so one, cultural foot within our organization. Um, can these people run in an operate optimally in an entrepreneurial type culture because we don't parachute South Africans. Let's say we're making a UK acquisition. We don't parachute people in until we buy a winning team. And we need to be comfortable that whilst they can deliver financially, because that's on the one hand what you see, the other aspects which are equally important, governance, culture fit, delivery, etc., also are important. And a lot of, a, a lot of that, I mean, really sits, sits in, in the caliber of the management team that you, you bring on board. So that receives its own due diligence. And in fact, in many instances, when the financial metrics stack up, if the other pieces don't stack up around the people and the governance, we walk away. Yeah, so in, in one of your interviews, you said, we have found that when we are in the room with management teams, we ask the right questions. Now, uh, uh, look, it's just me and you here. So I'm wondering if you could help me because we might want to grow Gibbs into other markets and <laughs> might want to ask the right questions. <laughs> so what are some of those right questions that we might want to think about yeah. when we're speaking to partners that we sure. want to grow with? Sure. So first of all, it starts with being very clear about what it is that you're looking for, what you're buying. So another tertiary institution doesn't necessarily mean that it's like a Gibbs, right? So there are many tertiary institutions out there, but they, they're not necessarily like a Gibbs. So one of the things that we, we're very clear about is we're going into this industry, hygiene services, but we're looking for a particular bespoke operating model. 
So we're not just looking for any hygiene business. We know what we're looking for. We know, we know what the revenue mix needs to look like. We know whether it should be a rental base or a, or a, or a one-off sale type business or whether it should be a combination. And if it should be a combination of what, what proportion? We know what margins we're looking at. We know what return profile we're looking at. So we're very clear around that. And that's why we can very quickly um, have a look at key metrics and say, this is a hygiene business, but it's not the kind of hygiene yeah. business that we're looking for, right? So, so we're able to do that quite quickly. Once, once we're then in, we ask the right questions because we're a trade buyer. We're not private equity. So we run the businesses in South Africa. Um, and, so, and so we know you, management can't, if management says anything to us that doesn't make sense, we're able to say to them it doesn't make sense because that, that industry doesn't work like that, you know, because we know it, we, we run it. We run those businesses in South Africa. Areas where we decide to expand internationally are areas where we're very comfortable that in our home territory, SA, we're number one, we've got significant market share, and we're really best in breed. You know, and so we take that excellence with us. And so we ask the right questions operationally um, and in every way. Due diligence around people is yeah. very, very important. And then the last thing, which is also more important, we won't make an acquisition, Morris, if we're not clear that we can add value. So we have to be able to add value to you. We need to be able to acquire Gibbs and double and treble your size and Please profitability. bring it on. <laughs> no. We are open for <laughs> no, business. No, 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 we're not buying education <laughs> institutions. <though. laughs> Although I must say, uh, it's, it, while it's great to learn from success, um, it's really hard to replicate success. Mm. So the inverse might be, it's better to avoid mistakes. And so with that in mind, I wonder if you could maybe share with us some of the things where you have failed as Bidvest, some of the acquisitions that you failed in, mm. uh, some of the lessons you learned from that that you hope never to repeat in mm. future transactions. Sure. So probably two come to mind. I mean, the, the first one, I, I mean, I was still very young in the group, but that's, that stays with us even today. And this was during Brian's time. We made an acquisition of a, of a food distribution business in France. Um, and until today, we stay away from France because we failed. Uh, we had to exit, which is unusual for us. Um, and it was interesting because it wasn't around all the other things that I've spoken about in terms of the metrics, the people, etc. It was actually the culture in country um, that was problematic. Um, oh, different. Oh, different. Yes. Sorry, you're right. So we don't want to you're get right. Uh, you're right. Uh, Emmanuel Macron <laughs> upset with us. Absolutely. <laughs> that was different. Yeah. And, and just our, our operation couldn't, you know, we, we're just not successful. Yeah. And it's an interesting one because even today we're, we're, we fear France. Yeah. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's simple things like language, yeah. you know, that all the other metrics are green. And then the language one is the one that actually becomes the biggest ba yeah. barrier. Um, so, so that's an interesting one, and, and across the group, or oh, everybody knows we failed in France. Let's just let's not let's, <laughs> let's, not, go ba let's not go back. You're there. reminding me of Roby Brosen. <laughs> he says, "I failed in Israel." <laughs> 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 Those people want to sell red meat in a chicken shop. Yeah, <laughs> so oh. <laughs> I, I failed in Israel. <laughs> yeah. um, and the, and then the second one I, is is well, is not a full failure, but it's just for me. It's a lesson around timing. Yeah. Um, so a couple of years ago, we, we acquired um, Brand Corp, uh, which was a set of industrial businesses, yeah. which fit properly. But we bought in a cycle and a time that was a downward cycle from an industrial perspective in the country. And so those businesses really struggled for many years, which is unusual for us because generally, as I say, we're clear we can add value, right? And so we were clear around the kind of value that we were able to add, but the macros yeah. was just a bigger challenge. Yeah. Um, it's an important point to make, though, that so in investments, we talk about systemic risk and mm. unsystemic risk, mm. right? So where uh, you have uh, the unsystemic risk part mm. properly managed mm. because it's about your own people, about your own capability. Mm. But the, the systemic one is beyond your control. Mm. It's what's happening around you. Yeah, right? absolutely. Um, and, and so that's a really important lesson. However, if I look at your chairman, Mr. Bonang Mohale, he's playing a big role in trying to influence the systemic part. And suppose linking it to the COVID experience, um, uh, what has been the role of Bidvest 
uh, and the role of business leaders like yourself mm. and business leaders like uh, Mr. Bonang Mahale in trying to nudge the mm. systemic part of risk in a direction that is helpful for you, your talents to thrive. Yeah. Sure. So, I mean, <laughs> during that period for me, there were just two things that shone out as priority. One was our people. Um, and how do we take care of our people? How do we, as far as possible, and it's impossible to insulate. I mean, I use the word insulate, which you can't from a pandemic, but, but how do we, as far as possible, create a safety net um, for our people? That was the first one. And, and the second part was our communities. You know, um, how, how, what role do we now play to, again, create a safety net for communities? What role do we now play to assist government in what they're trying to do to protect communities and as far as possible. Because for, for me, during the pandemic, it, we, we moved straight into team sport. It was tag teaming and team sport. And I think if as a corporate, you didn't realize that that's where you were and you kept a very insular view, um, I, I think that could have been a bit of a challenge. And so, so can you build on that? Because I think uh, when I listen to a lot of CEOs, they talk about, and I'm sure you'll also um, uh, feel that you did the same thing, but uh, I'm sensing that, and I'll tell you what the thing is, I'm sensing you did a little bit more that than, than the thing, which is our first priority was to take care of our people. And I know when I read your integrated report, it says, yes, our mm. first priority was to take care of our people. But my sense is that's only one piece. And when you're talking about team sport, it's a much broader concept than simply being insular, taking mm -hmm. care of our people. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on that? Sure. So, so from a team sport perspective, um, one of the things that we did initially is when the Minister of Education came out to say, we're opening schools, we need to get kids back into school. Um, you know, we were sitting and on Monday put together a team to say, what do we do and how do we get kids back into school? And for me, that was important because all of a sudden you had a cohort of the year of 2020 where this invisible virus had just come in and, and really just created such massive risk in terms of their futures um, and, and their ability to, to get through matric and, and get into university or technical school or whatever it is. Um, and so we reached out to all the provinces. Uh, we provided free decontamination services, hygiene services, PPE, etc. And literally within a week had decontaminated just under 2,000 schools and enabled 1.2 million learners to return to school. Um, after that, we then identified communities because, I mean, one of the things that was also happening at the time is that many companies were retrenching, you know, I including ours. Um, and so we knew that from a socio-economic perspective and a social perspective, um, citizens of the country were going to be in need. Um, we rolled out over three months, uh, 20,000 households um, we fed um, over a three-month period in three provinces. Um, and we, we work through local NGOs, et cetera, just again to create you know, another safety net as far as we could. Um, linked to education, we have actually, we're in the process right now of selecting bursaries, uh, kids for bursaries. Um, we, we did the Warsaw metric as well. So just in terms of digital learning, as we've been speaking, we partnered with the Department of Education and we said, listen, it's now, how do we get universal access out there? because schools are opening, closing, etc. cetera. I, I learned through watching William Smith <laughs> and his transparencies on TV, so I know that works. And so we partnered with the SABC and, and um, uh, uh, Department of Education, and we were Wozo Matric, and, 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 and we had the curriculum on TV. And, and through that, we also then went bursary, yeah. write a letter, and we've got a couple of kids that, that we, you know, we're funding. Um, and, I'm, and I'm excited about the class of 2020. I'm looking out for them because those kids are resilient. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about the strategy of, the, of Bidvest. But let's stay with this personal reflection and say, so you come in as group CEO uh, in around, uh, is it October? October last year. 2020, having joined uh, Bidvest in um, 2003. So you obviously, as you said, you grew up in one of mm. the subsidiaries, so you understand the culture. 
how was that transition for you during this period? Um, for you to transition into taking over from Lindsay and, 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 and now you're finding yourself if, as the buck stops with you, right? Mm. <laughs> You've got nowhere else to go to. You can't <laughs> escalate to anybody else. How was that? Can you help us to understand that transitioning into a new role um, in, 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 at this time? Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I must say, I mean, the, I think the pandemic created complexity. The transition itself, if I just think about Bidvest um, as a company, was it was very well planned over a very long period of time. I mean, I've spoken very honestly around the fact that the first time I had conversations with uh, Brian and Lindsay around potentially coming in as chief executive was seven or eight years ago. Um, and so there'd been this long process, really, uh, um, of kind of getting ready for the seat. Um, the announcement around CEO designate happened 18 months before, and so Lindsay and I had 18 months really to accelerate the handover. Um, and, and then, of course, the pandemic hit, um, and then we needed to get into a mode of just thinking around recovery of our, of our businesses. So from a Bidvest perspective, it really wasn't complex. What created the complexity was really the pandemic and, and how we... No one, no one had the pandemic on their risk register. Yeah. So, <laughs> so no, one, no one had anything to pull out to say, you know, this is the business continuity plan, you know, that we implement. And so we were all kind of thinking on our feet. Yeah. Um, but I mean, for me and, and, and people are, are very key for me. So in, in October, I, I went to the factory sh shop, shop floors, you know. I walked the warehouses, I worked at factories, I went to see management teams. I went to see teams where we had lost some of our employees from COVID and spent some time with them. I went to see as many as, as I could. Um, and, and it's a drop in the ocean because we've got more than 200 businesses, right? And I did that because when I wanted to get uh, my own temperature gauge um, of how people were feeling. I wanted to get my own sense direct without any broken telephone of what it looked like when we were helping as group. When we, what, did, what does it look like when we're making the right decisions? And what does it look like when we're making the wrong decisions? Yeah. You know, and I wanted to get that direct from the management teams and, and just a sense of, so are we able to think about growth right now or are we stuck? Has the pandemic kind of created this inertia? Or, 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 or are the teams really able to, to move? And I, and I wanted to get my own sense um, around that. So I walked the shop floors. I went to see a couple of the businesses. Um, I also ran a, a, a digital process of just trying to communicate to everybody around strategy, vision, mm -hmm. where we're at, and trying to give hope, you know. Um, and, and, and really, for me, that was the focus. I, I always say that I'm very clear that Bidvest is about people. Uh, if, if the people aren't in the right space, you actually don't have a business. And so that's where you need to start. And then the results will come. Yeah. Um, and because the pandemic was also a health pandemic that was also emotionally, physically and mentally draining, I felt that there's a lot of work that we yeah. needed to do from a people perspective. And that really, really in the main was my focus and just getting the energy levels up and just creating hope. Lovely. So there's, we've got almost 200 people on the call as we speak. So I encourage you to pose questions on the chat on LinkedIn Live, and I'll be happy to pass them on to Mpumi. So let me ask you a question about leadership yet again. So you spoke about what I'd call management by walkabout, being connected at a time when mm -hmm. most people are disconnected. Um, so, so that's telling me that a, a lot of the stuff that we've always learned and taught in the field of leadership was very relevant mm. in this COVID context mm. as you were taking over. But the question is, surely you must have learned some unexpected things as a leader. And, and what are some of those? I'd, I'd be very interested to, <laughs> to maybe pick your mind around that. Unexpected? Yes. Um, so, so, so perhaps one of the things that, that, that was unexpected for me was the the extent to which, um, and you know when you've got more than 100,000 people, and especially in our organization where we don't have 100,000 people reporting to the same building um, or the same place of work, you know, yeah. everybody reports separately, you, you kind of think that you also have this... Um, I suppose a disaggregation and, and just kind of getting the team, teamwork and the cohesiveness 
is 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 not as easy. What was what was unexpected for me was was going through talking to people and seeing them really having a very clear understanding of what we were doing and some of the complications complexities that we were dealing with. Um, some of the very simple strategic directions came from the shop floor, um, from those conversations. Uh, simplicity. Um, I, I, I remember talking to someone and saying, you know, can you just keep it simple and can you just be clear about what it is that you're doing? <laughs> we were judged for some of the decisions that we made. So some of the interesting unexpected feedback was we saw you guys do that and that wasn't great. You know? And what you guys should have done is the following. And if you can just manage our expectation, if we can just be clear around what it is that you guys are expecting from us, then it will make our lives easier. Um, I think what was also unexpected a little bit was just the freedom that people had, you know, to articulate and communicate uh, challenges, opportunities, whatever was, was happening. What was also interesting for me is how after walking the shop floor, I then got a flurry of emails, letters, people handwriting and, and just, you know, saying, uh, you know, I exist. Yeah. I hope that you see me. Yeah. I exist So leadership here. visibility is so important Absolutely. in a crisis. Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I wonder if you could, once again, remember I, I said we can learn something from mm. successes, but we learned a little, little bit about failures. So you mentioned now um, uh, that uh, some of your peers, some of your colleagues were pointing out to you uh, that you could have shown up differently, you could mm. have presented differently mm. to enable them to manage their expectations mm. or for you to manage their expectations. Mm. Um, and I wonder if you could just share with us how were you showing up and what did you learn from that? Because I mm. think a lot of us in leadership positions might have thought we were doing well, mm. creating the right expectation when actually maybe we were over promising and under delivering. Mm. I'm, I'm not sure if that's what happened with you. Um, but I'd be very interested in what was the what, were the, what was the shop floor where the, the colleagues mm. criticizing of the top management team? So the, the criticism was, I mean, and, and the main theme criticism was, was as follows. So we run a decentralized operating model. COVID hit, but we were clear at group that we needed a level of consistency in certain areas to ensure that there's fairness, one, and two, that the messaging out there to our clients is also consistent. So that we don't have client X getting a different messaging from, from that one, yet it's the same process. So there was a little bit of centralization. Um, and in an organization that's decentralized, you can imagine yes. the, the, the kind of kickback yeah. around, but why are you guys telling us what to do? You know, we've always, and we were like, but we have to treat our, our, our staff the same yeah. because they come from the same community. Yeah. So you can't have one getting a salary and the other one not getting a salary. Yeah. So please, just for this moment. So, you yeah, know. so you were, so what I'm hearing you saying is you were arresting the culture a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> and, and because we felt it yeah. necessary. Yes. We felt it necessary for it to be clear to our clients yeah. who we are during this pandemic and that that message is not a mixed bag, yes. you know? And so we arrested it a little bit. Yeah. And as expected, of course. There was pushback. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is good. Yeah. Which is good because we've got entrepreneurs, right? Yeah. And entrepreneurs, when you arrest them, must tell you, I don't like this. And, and if they hadn't, it would have been a problem because you'd have thought, why yes. are these guys accepting every command yes. I'm giving? Right? Yes, yeah. yes. And what it also enabled us in terms of just pulling back to our operating model, enabled us to pull back quickly yeah. uh, and let go of just one or two of those things because we were clear that we're yeah. creating a level of discomfort while we felt that for a temporary time it was necessary. But once we've done it, we, we could then give back the reins again. Absolutely. So let's move back a little bit back to strategy. And if I were to look at some of your, com not quite competitors, but in certain sectors, mm. uh, businesses, large South African businesses that would be considered competitors of yours, like Imperial and Bala World, they've followed a different route of, if I can use an old mutual language, of de-merging some of their businesses and, and, and allowing their shareholders direct access to those investments. Now, it looks to me that uh, 
Bidvest continues to drive the same business model it has had, operating model, let me rather say, it has had for the past 30 odd years. And it doesn't look like you, there's anything that's going to disturb that. Um, what, if I'm, am I right? And if I'm right, what might inform that? So we also had a demerger. I think people have forgotten. Please re re-educate. <laughs> <laughs> In 2016, we, un we unbundled our Abs food distribution absolutely. business. We've done it. Yeah. So we also went through a phase of saying, how do we create better value for, for shareholders? So pre-2016, we had a bid, a bid vest that was in 39 countries. Half of it was food distribution. The other half was a strong industrial South African business. In fact, our share price at the time, I think at its peak, got to about 320, I think it was, um, a share. Um, and when we unbundled, the share price went, the combined share price went north of 500. And, and as a shareholder, you could choose yeah. which of the two you wanted to be vested in, whether you wanted an international food distribution business and that's where you wanted to put your capital, or whether you wanted to be in an industrial business that had really its own aspirations around growth um, in different sectors. We did it. And so you're comfortable that now the kind of model that you have is sustainable mm. into the future? Absolutely. Absolutely. The food distribution business was given its own leash uh, with his own CEO, Bernard, who's based in Australia, to carry on that growth. We ended up post the um, unbundling really almost 100% SA. Yeah. Today we're 20% international. Yeah. We're very clear about that. So the let's talk areas. about that 20% international. So it looks like you, you have continued to be very successful in your international acquisition strategies. So, so what might account for that? So what is it that makes you different compared to some South African uh, counterparts who are not as successful with their mm. international acquisitions? Patience. Um, I've already spoken around the other parts around we are clear about the business models. We're not trying to duplicate Bidvest in its form in another country because it, it, it would be impossible to yeah. do spoken about the fact that we're clear around the operating models that we're following at the moment. We've got three key areas that we're following from a, an international acquisition perspective. I've spoken a little bit around our due diligence process and the extent to which it is thorough, but we're patient. Uh, we'll look for the right business. We'll do the right transaction at the right price um, at the right time. I mean, PHS, the transaction goes through uh, May 2020, but we started looking at that transaction far earlier, years before, we walked away from it and then it came back two years later. The changes and the red marks that we had seen were now green and we were then comfortable to do that acquisition. I think we're, we're patient in the space. We, if there's anything in terms of our metrics that we look at around our really bespoke bid vest process of making acquisition, anything that's red, we stop until everything is green and we're patient. We don't rush into acquisitions. Um, and I think for us, you know, other than all the other technical bits, I think that's a big advantage. We, 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 do, and we, don't send we don't set acquisition targets, just by the way. So whilst we're an organization that grows by acquisition, there's no division that's got a target that says, you must be X percent international by this time, or you need to do so many. We don't do that because that drives wrong management behavior. You could get management just doing acquisitions because they need to tick a particular box. Right acquisition at the right time, at the right price. So talking about ticking the right boxes, and to the extent that it's in the public domain, what are some of those matrices that you are driving as a combined management team to ensure you get the right behavior from the operating business units, the right behavior sure. from the division? Sure. So, I mean, we've got our financial metrics, um, as, as all organizations have. Uh, we, we would measure trading profit. Returns are a big thing for us. We still have what they call Rofi for Joffy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is return on funds employees, and that's really me measuring your returns on your tangible assets. And, and a return for a hygiene business would be very different to a freight business, very different to a bank. And so everybody has got their really bespoke metrics. Margins are all different. So from a financial perspective, we're very clear for this business. These are your financial metrics, and this is what you need to deliver on. Um, and, then, and then coupled with that, we also have non-financial metrics because it's not just the financial aspects, right, that talk to good leadership and good businesses. And in fact, coming back to the pandemic, what I found was that the people that were stronger on the non-financial side 
were the ones that were able to do more because there was really just so much chaos. Um, and so we've got our non-financial metrics that are around people, that are around ESG, that are around sustainability, that are around transformation. Because all of those are equally important. And we manage those quite, quite closely. So whether you're a CEO or an HR director or a general manager um, or a client relations manager, everybody's got those. And they sit in those two buckets of financial and non-financial. Lovely. So talking about sustainability, I, I, I noticed, for example, that Bidvest is a BE level four in a South African context, which then obviously suggests that you take tr transformation in a South African context very seriously. Um, how do you drive other key uh, SDG matrices throughout the Bidvest value chain? Yeah. So by the way, we're not, we're not happy with our level four because we were a level three. I mean, unfortunately, we dropped only because of lockdown. Just our businesses couldn't do training and learnerships and all sorts of things. So we unfortunately slipped. But at an individual level, most of our, of our businesses are level ones and twos. In fact, more than 50% of our businesses are level ones and twos. Um, and the level four is really just, it's a group matrix uh, or transformation metric. But each business has got its own, has got its own scorecard. Um, in, in, in relation to sustainability, the, the, the way in which we drive it is we say to all our businesses so when you think about uh, the environment which aspects are, are more key to you so so we don't take an approach that says you need to have a metrics of all the SDGs and have a spreadsheet of all the SDGs and, and tick what you're doing on water electricity we, we, we don't do it like that what we what we say is if you are for example a freight business and carbon emissions are key for you and you're a big emitter that's where you then need to focus. That is your baby from a sustainability perspective. And that's where we as group will be looking at you to say, so what are you doing? Are you making progress, et cetera? If you're a, a, a laundry business and you're using a hang of a lot of electricity and water, we then say to you, well, th this is where you are material from an environment perspective. And we then hold you accountable in yeah. those spaces. And, and really, that, that, that's how we measure it. And Lovely. Yeah. So in the remaining forward minutes, um, I wonder if we could then maybe talk about uh, your relationship with business and society and some of the work that you did. I presume you participated in the Solidarity Fund, for example, and such related activities. Yeah. So, so yes, I mean, we, we, from a group perspective, contributed to the Solidarity Fund last year um, as, as part of uh, that corporate citizenry role. Um, I also sit on, on the board of Business Leadership South Africa. Um, I, <laughs> through last year, through Business for SA, um, co-led the supply chain at Workstream. We were trying to open up the economy through lockdown and work with government. At the moment, I'm in another Workstream around vaccine distribution. I, at a personal level, I, I'm always, always interconnected um, from that space because I think I said it earlier, I am very clear that whilst we may run our business as well, right? But 86% cash generation, or 86% up on cash generation, and your HIPs up 6.1%, and your trading profit up. All those metrics are great, but they don't mean much if the country doesn't work. Um, and so at a very personal level, I'm very clear that all of us uh, have a responsibility to play in ensuring that the country works, in supporting government where it needs support, and, and at 2 o'clock in the morning and at whatever time, putting the time and the energy and the focus and applying our skills to make sure that we move the economy forward. So for me, that's very important because I understand that when that works, then our businesses live in a bigger ecosystem. And so again, you can't be insular, but be very cognizant of the fact that you live in an ecosystem. Lovely. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come almost to the end. And so allow me to thank Mpumi uh, for sharing her journey at Bidvest. And we look forward to hearing uh, the full year results as a data point which reflects the resilience of this business. And once again, we look forward to seeing you continue to succeed not only for South Africa and in South Africa, but in other markets in which you operate. And of course, we wish you the best of luck as a South African leader who is socially connected 
in an environment where we continue to experience vulnerability, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity where the vulnerability has replaced volatility mm -hmm. in the VUCA 2.0. So Mpumi, thank you so much for all that you do at Bidvest and may you continue to succeed. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Morris. Thanks everyone.